following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. I wanted to talk to you this morning about something that is, uh, I think, our greatest single opportunity that we have alive here on planet Earth. The greatest single opportunity, the greatest thing that we can do and participate with, if you ask me, is meeting with God, literally having encounters with God. When I look at my life and I look at the Bible and I look at the snapshots of what heaven is going to look like, encountering God is central to it all. And the beauty is we don't have to wait until heaven to encounter God in some very tangible ways. We look through the Bible, there's been encounters with God all along through his people. He says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. He says, if you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. In other words, God, the lover of your soul, the creator of the universe says, I love you and I wanna meet with you. And that is something he's been doing historically since the beginning. And many of you have had experiences like that. Um, We're talking about how some of these encounters actually happen, how we meet with God, and what happens when we, we do meet with God. And so uh, how many of you guys were here last week? Show of hands. How many guys? Okay, about half of you guys. Um, when we meet with God, we go through a soul-altering experience. We can never be the same after having an encounter with God. And all these people in the Bible that had an encounter with God, they were changed. They got a perspective. They got a heart change. They got a mission, a vision. They've got filled with love or peace or forgiveness. These encounters with God change people forever. And that's why we were talking about alter, altering experiences when we come to the altar of God, so to speak. When we come to God's altar, these things happen. Now, we don't want to think of an altar necessarily as a place you kneel down or a place that's made out of granite or marble or has... Uh, some etching in it or gold. We're not talking about that kind of altar. We're talking about spiritually a place where you and I seek God, meet God, encounter God. That would qualify as an altar. Um, And last week we looked at some of the the things that happen. I know uh, if you're married, uh, more than likely you went to the altar Uh, symbolically speaking, and God makes two people one. God does a holy union, which only God can do, and it's something we do when we meet God at the altar and we invite God into our vows and what we're doing. God does these things. So the altar is symbolic of meeting God and God changing us. Sometimes people come to the altar to dedicate their lives to the Lord or to rededicate or come forward to meet God for healing, whatever it might be. These are certain encounters. So today we're looking at a a pretty awesome passage, an intense one, but I just want to recap really quick and build on some of the cool, amazing things that happened at altars in the Old Testament. Just a real quick flyby to cover, uh, catch up from last week on what happens when we encounter God at these altars. What transaction happens? What kind of altars are the uh, these altars of God, when, when God's people come to meet God, what, why do they do it? When do they do it? For what purpose do they do it? And what happens in that interaction with God? A lot of amazing stuff. So a quick, a quick uh, overview of the first uh, altar that we see in the Bible was Genesis 4. And you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to fly through these really quick to get to where we are now. The first altar we saw in the Bible, the first one to ever come up, was Cain and Abel. And Cain and Abel... Their altar was an altar of worship to God, an altar of sacrifice. And we saw in the very first altar in the, in the entire recording of the Bible, we see Abel bringing his first portion and his best portion to God at the altar and God being pleased, smiling on that. We see his brother Cain pulling something out of the dirt and going, maybe this will work. Maybe God's cool with this. And God was not smiling on his offering because God saw, as Janine said earlier, it's connected to the heart. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so that was the first altar we see. And we we determined that the altar is a place that reveals our heart and our motives. Our hearts and motives are revealed at the altar. We come before God. Everything is laid out, bare and transparent. No matter what we, we, we think or feel, it's all right there before God. And so in this situation of the first altar, 
is absolute transparency before God. There's nothing that can be hidden in the presence of God at the altar of God. The next one we saw was Noah in Genesis 8. Noah is on the ark for a long time. If you read the account, it not only rained for 40 days and 40 nights, the, the floodgates of the earth burst forth. And it's, it, when you read the account, it took many, many months for the water to recede to finally get out of the ark. And we realize the first thing he did when he got out of the ark, the first thing he did was not like find a driving range, go do something fun, you know. First thing he did on this ark for a long time was build an altar, the first thing. As soon as he got out of that ark, first thing I'm doing is I'm building an altar and I want to worship and acknowledge God for the journey he just brought us through for his grace, his protection, his sovereignty. He is good. God's getting an altar and he builds an altar and an altar, we realized, was a place of priority. An altar determines a place of priority. If God's a priority in our life, altars represent that. And again, don't think of the altar as a physical formation It's a place where you and I get intentional to seek God, to meet with God, and transact with God, because when we do, when we have these encounters with God, our soul is changed. You can't look at the narrative of Scripture and look at all these encounters that people had at the altar. People were changed. We are changed when we encounter God in these altar-type environments. Um, Now, In Genesis 12, Abraham comes up. Now, Abraham is called the father of faith. He's the father of faith. It all started with Abraham. Uh, Father Abraham had many sons. You learn the song, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It all started with Abraham. Abraham was very blessed. The Bible says that Abraham was very blessed. What you will find in Abraham's life is that Abraham was very big, very big on building altars. He was very big on building altars to meet God, to transact with God, to communicate with God, to encounter God, and radical things happened in his life. And so the first one we saw with Abraham was in response to God's revelation. God spoke something to him, and he said, God, you're so amazing. I just want to build this altar. I want to worship you in this place. I want to continue to adore you. I want to meet with you, God. Thank you so much for speaking to me. And then right after that, The next scene we see, just a little bit later, he's like, God, I want to hear from you. And because I want to hear from you, I'm going to build an altar and I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to worship to you, God. And in that time of sacrifice, God speaking in response to the altar. These are the first altars in the Bible. And I think they set a healthy course for you and I to understand how we transact with God, how we encounter God, and the things that happen at these altars. Um... The next altar in Abraham's life uh, was one where after he was traveling a while, he realized, you know what? I think I need to draw closer to God. And he says, I'm going back to that place where the last altar I built was. I'm going back to the last place where I really encountered God and had a holy moment where God met me. And if you think about that in your life, you know of a time and a place, and it's not because it was a, it's not because it was a, it was a rock formation or gold inlay marble. It wasn't that. But you know there was a time and place where you pressed in and you were crying out to God. If you, you, does anybody have any of these moments in your life where you were pressing in, crying out to God? Okay, that was an altar moment. You were pressing in, you were crying out to God, you were drawing near to God and God draw near to you and that was a time and a place where God met you. And you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes, like Abraham, you have to go back to that place where the Lord last touched you, where he last spoke to you. If it's been a while, go back to the last place. Again, not a physical altar kind of place, but in here, get with God in that space again. It could be a location, but the point is it's, it's a heart condition where we get before God and say, please, God, I'm coming back to that place. You know, I love that song. I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. You know that song? I'm sorry for the things I've made it. I'm coming back. And, and, and in our lives, we always have to check ourselves to come back to that place where we met God, where our heart was right, uh, because even that worship band is writing about that song and they realize it, it turned into a performance and records and they're like, what are we doing? We, we gotta come back to just adoration of God. We just gotta come back to pure, simple adoration of God. And so this is what happens here is you gotta sometimes come back. The next thing we see in his life, Abraham's life, again, he's big on altars. 
He's about to go into unknown territory. He has no idea what he's going to encounter. And he's like, before I go anywhere, because I'm going into uncharted territory, first thing I'm doing is I'm building an altar. I'm going to build an altar. I'm going to meet with God because I have no idea what's up ahead, but God does. So I'm going to meet with God. And I would encourage all of you to do that. I know when I came to LA, I was pursuing a music career. I come to LA and that's what drew me to faith. I felt one thing I needed to do. I felt for some reason I need to draw close to God because I'm going into an uncharted territory. And in this quest of, of building an altar before God, in this quest of seeking him out and trying to understand his ways, I met God. And God transformed me. I was altered and I was changed because this is what happens all through the Bible when you're willing to draw near and really seek God and encounter God. So we worship before going into unknown territory. And then the next one, Genesis 22, was the hardest altar he ever built in his life. It was an altar that he had to put his son on. And this is called an altar of consecration. This is when something's so dear to you that you start to love it so much. You might love it more than you love God. And maybe you'd say no, but you don't know the answer to that until you put it on the altar. See, the altar of consecration is the only test. It's the only test of our true love. To say, really, is it you first? I say it is, but is it really God? And in this altar of consecration, Abraham, who built many altars to God, And now loved his son a whole lot, which is good. That's honorable. And God says, I love you, but I need to test something right here. And it's an altar of consecration. And at the altar of consecration, if God is first, you go, God, you're first and here's proof. Now, God is not asking anyone, nor has he ever asked anyone else in history to do this. So God's not physically asking anyone to put their child on an altar like this. But the Bible says clearly in the passage, it says, because, because you have not withheld your only son from me, because you have not withheld your son, I'm going to bless you richly. And of course, that was a foreshadow of God sending his only son. So all the Jewish people who know about Abraham will know, wait a minute, I've heard that before. Why do I know that? Because that passage explains the father's love. The father of faith, it began with him. And if you have any recollection of Abraham offering up his only son and God being pleased, anyone will know later on that Jesus Messiah came and will go, oh, wait a second, I'm connecting the dots. I get it. I understand the nature of God and what sacrifice means. But an altar is a place of consecration. Is it God's or is it mine? We can say what we want, but until we put it on the altar, we will will never know. And so uh, the cool thing about this is Abraham... His son grows up. Isaac grows up. And Isaac starts building altars. This is really cool. This is where it gets exciting. He starts building altars. So Abraham built them and Isaac built them. And if you have an altar building parent or you live in a home where you guys build altars, again, symbolically, not physically building a place to kneel with candles in your home, no shrines. We're not talking about molten images, shrines or images. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a system of honor in your home where you honor God and you seek him. And there's, a, there, there's an understanding, there's a culture in your home where God is sought and you pray and you seek God and there's this encountering of God that's expected and desired in a home. That's a culture of building altars, so to speak, symbolically like they did through history. Abraham did it so well. Isaac had an altar building dad. And when kids have an altar building dad or mom, they see it and they get it. And that's what happened in this. We said that altars are not something that are taught, they are caught. You catch it, you get it, you're raised in it. And that was amazing. This is a godly legacy and process. And not to end just with Abraham and Isaac, but check this out. Isaac has a son named Jacob and Jacob is building altars. And that shows the legacy That is at stake if you have an altar-building parent. You get to build this legacy. And Jacob is now building an altar in Genesis 33. He built his altar, listen to this, where he pitched his tent. In other words, if this is where I'm going to have my bed, and this is where I'm going to have my room, my house, my shelter, my apartment, my condo, whatever it is, if this is where I'm going to lay down at night, I'm building an altar. I'm having a place to seek God where I lay my head, where I sleep, under my roof. Does that make sense? 
He's like, if I'm going to pitch my tent here, if I'm going to call this home, then I am having a place to see God in my home. And so that was a radical, um, you know, just snapshot of the legacy, the legacy of a family willing to encounter God and have these, these altering experiences. So establish worship in your home. It's a dedicated time and place to worship God. Does not need to be some kind of kneeler with some stuff on the wall. No, but have a place that is a place where you will stop, be still, seek God, draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. But it's got to be intentional. It doesn't happen, make your coffee, eating your eggs, running out the door, boom. That, that's, that's, that, there's no intentional altar in that. It's a place where you seek God. And when you seek him with all your heart, he will be found by us, is what he tells us. So this was modeled really well for, for Jacob and for Isaac. And some of you, some of you were raised in a home where your family, your parents already started to build legacy like this. Some of you were raised in a home where you had a family, a mother and father who, who loved the Lord and they modeled their love for the Lord. It wasn't just that they taught you, although they taught you, you actually caught, you caught this spiritual aroma. You can, you can see what's going on here is real. It's, it's legitimate. It is tangible. There's a legitimate love for God and seeking God and God meeting our family when we seek him. And as a result, if you were raised in that kind of home, it wasn't so much taught, it was caught. And that is absolutely beautiful because God is building a legacy through your family line. There will be generational blessings if you continue that because that's exactly what happened with Abraham Isaac and Jacob, and not just Jacob, but Jacob's 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. That's pretty cool. There is a lineage of blessing right there because God is sought first. You have an altar building culture where God is sought regularly and the kids catch it. They simply get it. And some of you were raised in that kind of environment. You were raised where you had a parent who was doing that and you're like, I see it. But some of you, Some of us were not raised where there was an altar in the home, so to speak, where there wasn't adoration of God or corporately come together. We need to cry out to God for someone, even in the family or someone outside. Come together. We're going to seek God on this one family Uh, or or, or climate of worship or altar building. There wasn't that. It didn't exist in your home. (laughs) Here's the beauty. (laughs) You get to start the legacy. You get to begin the legacy this legacy of meeting at the altar of God on behalf of your home, as Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know what the neighbors are doing. I don't know what they're doing down the block. I don't know what the kids are at school are doing. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you live that way in your home, apartment, condo, wherever you live, if that's your climate, or if you got roommates, hey, in my room or in my part, this is the way I roll. I see God. I put God first. You don't have to. It's okay. But I will seek the Lord. As for me and my house, so much as it's up to me, we will seek the Lord. And this is really important because when you do this, I think the kids look and I think they catch it. I think they catch something legitimate about this. They see it's real. And when you hear these statistics of kids who fall away from faith later on, I don't know how much they really experience with the fruit of it. They were probably taught some things and to memorize things. And that's good. That is important to memorize and know God's word and hide it in your heart. But did they see fruition? Because fruit cannot be denied. When you taste and see that the Lord is good, you can never forget that flavor, ever. You can never forget that the Lord is good. So things like this need to be need to be uh, taught, but more importantly, caught. In our house, we have a, on Sunday night, we'll do a family night. And on family night, we'll do worship. And we'll gather around at the end of our, whatever we do, we have food. Each kid gets to pick each week what they want to do. Want to have pizza, want to play this game, hide the seat, whatever it is. But we'll include worship. And as a family, on family night, we'll worship. Now, the younger ones uh, are quick to break out uh, some, some loud musical instruments uh, anything that'll make pots or a pan, just hit, something to hit on. You know, the Bible says make a joyful noise, right? So we, we take that literal. And so we get around and we, we'll, we'll do some songs. But we do this, not that the youngest ones fully get it, but I think our older three are starting to get, as a family, we want to and we desire to seek 
God because if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. We're trying to develop a culture in our home of being an altar building family. Does that make sense? And I encourage you to do the same. Maybe you have that legacy in your lineage already. If not, you get to start it. Praise God for that opportunity that God restores the breach and he starts a whole new work. He says, behold, I make all things new and let your family be one where there's a generational blessing as a result of your obedience to be an altar building son or daughter of God. I think that's really awesome. Um, You know, one time I just want to share and you can turn to 1 Kings 18 if you would, please. 1 Kings 18 um, will be our passage today. We're looking at an altar that is a pretty amazing altar. Um, but before, as you're turning there, I just want to share, um, there was a time where I went out to the desert, out to, uh, to Joshua Tree, and um, it was a, a, just a time I really wanted to press in and seek the Lord on some things. So sometimes getting away, Jesus did it in the Bible, to get away, to fast, to pray, to seek God, to get intentional about seeking God. I, I went out there, what I didn't realize is how hot it would be out there, it was like 110 degrees. And uh, out there fasting, seeking God, and there wasn't a lot of shade. There's a lot of big rocks out there. If you've been to Joshua Tree, there's some really cool rock formations, not a lot of shade. So you, you try to get on the backside of a rock so you have a little bit of shade, but as the sun moves, you've got to go find another spot somewhere. So I'm out there on this large rock finding a little slice of shade. And as I was drawing near to God, pressing in, I had this burden, this request. I'm sitting out there, I'm praying, I'm reading the word, and I, I just had this thing bubbling up in me, and I just had to say, God... I know you love me and you know I love you. We we know that, God. But can I ask you something, God? I said, Father, I wanna I wanna feel your love. I I know you love me. And I know you know that I love you, but I I I I wanna feel your love. And there's nobody around for miles out there in the bacon sun, and I'm just like I'm I'm building this altar and I'm seeking God. It wasn't but a few minutes later where I had a soul-altering experience because God honored this altar. And this is the way it came about. I waited and then I sat down and I started reading my word again. It wasn't but five or ten minutes later, much to my surprise, that a dark cloud comes blowing in over this 110 degree temperature sun, blowing in, and then it starts to pour rain but not warm rain, the coldest rain I've ever felt in my life. And I'm out there at 110 degrees and I'm sitting there going, this is beautiful. And I couldn't distinguish the difference between the tears and the rain because it was absolutely beautiful. And I asked God, Father, I want to feel your love. And I'm in the middle of a desert, 110 degrees, and he's pouring out cold rain on me. What do you say about that? That's not a freak of nature. That is God honoring his, his kids. Now, I can go out and try that again, and it may not ever happen again. All I know is I ask God, if I build an altar to seek you, God, will you honor that? And he says, yes, I will. If you seek me and you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. And God honored that to me. And my, my soul, it was a soul-altering experience because all of these encounters change you along the way. All these encounters change you when you meet with God. You can't be the same. Look at Isaiah. He has this encounter with God in a throne room experience and he's like, whoa, God, I'm a man of unclean lips and God gives him a calling and a hope and a future and an anointing and says, go if you're willing to go. And he's like, I'm willing, God. And these encounters happen when we have these moments of seeking God and drawing near and being intentional about it. So um, I just would encourage you guys, draw near, be an altar building son of God, be an altar building daughter of God, not out of any wood formation kind of weird thing, statues, no, but just a time and a place where you and I get intentional to stop and seek and press in and encounter God because encountering will be the result of that. Um, 1 Kings 18 is uh, this altar I want to look at today. I really had a burden to share this altar with you. Now I bring this altar up. Um, It's kind of got a bittersweet flavor Uh, because this is Elijah's altar. This is Elijah's altar. And I look at Christy, because when we were in Israel, we went on this trip to Israel, um, and we went with a group of us, and before we went, we said, uh, what is your favorite spot in Israel or favorite story in the Bible? Because we're going to try to hit all these locations, and when we go to these locations, whatever your favorite spot is, you get to read the passage and give us the devotional. 
Because it's, it's the place that's closest in your heart, whatever that is. And somebody said, well, the, the Temple Mount, that's always blown me away. And so sure enough, on the trip, someone got to do the devotional while we all sat around the Temple Mountain, you know, uh, uh, over in Nazareth or wherever, Sea of Galilee, everyone picked these spots. But one day, we were covering a lot of ground. We went to Megiddo where the Battle of Armageddon is going to be fought. We went to Nazareth. And as we're coming around to get to Mount Carmel for the Elijah story, which we're still waiting here. Christy's got an amazing Elijah story. Um, it's just he, God's developing it over the years. But uh, that, that was one thing. The sun was going down. It was already getting dark. And we had miles and we never got the Elijah story. So I'm going to give a, 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 a version of the Elijah story. I say stay tuned because Christy's got an amazing Elijah story. Um, but 1 Kings 18 they're living in a time and a place where their country, it turned from God. The country wasn't building altars anymore. The people were not building altars. They used to, not anymore. And there was an agenda in the country that was taken over. And this agenda was head up by King Ahab and Jezebel, his wife. And they're their agenda was not a God-honoring agenda. In fact, it was defiling the things of God in a, in a pretty, pretty broad sense. And the people of God felt, the people of God felt like they were losing a battle. They were saying, we rem- remember the old days, God. I don't know why it's like this, but evil has taken over our land, God. And it's not good and we're not happy. We don't like it, God. And where are you? We seem like we're losing God. This is the, the climate of the culture going on right now. And the prophets of Baal, which is a demonic sense of worship, Baal worship, they were appointed by the king to kind of be the prophets in the land and take over. And God's people felt like they needed to hide and be on the run. This this is the climate of the land right now, if that gives you any sense of the power of this altar we're going to talk about right here. Um, And so the altar of God at this point was broken down and it was abandoned. And it had been like that for some time. So uh, 1 Kings 18, if you want to jump in in verse 20, we'll look at this in sections. Verse 20 starts, so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set it on fire, not set a fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and I will put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, What you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. And since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And then they danced around the altar they had made and at and. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping or maybe he must be awakened. So they shouted louder. They slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response, no one answered, and no one paid attention. This Baal worship that was going on was a very demonic form of worship, uh, and instead of Israel, God's people doing what God told them to do, which was dedicate your children to the Lord dedicate your children. On the eighth day, you'd bring your child in the day. You'd dedicate your child to the Lord. God, you gave us this child. Let us raise this child for your glory. This is Israel's way of doing things. But Baal was, no, don't dedicate your child to the Lord. Throw your child into the fire. The gods of Molech and Baal worship the Canaan. This is what they're doing. Thinking it makes the God happy and will bless you. And they're taking what is supposed to be set apart for God and throwing in the, this is the culture. 
This is how far removed the culture is taking life and just throwing it away. The culture is way out there. The culture is, is, is way lost. And in this place, Elijah has this sense, the altar's broken down, the country's going the wrong way, the people of God are feeling defeated. That's it. It's enough. It is time for an altar. And this altar, this altar will be the altar of showdown. This is a showdown. This is like a shootout in the Wild West. It's on, it's a showdown, and it's now, and that's enough. And if you look in the Bible, you will see times of showdown where God would put up with things, put up with things, and the Bible will say, my cup of wrath is not yet full. And we're all thinking, God, how could it not be full? And God's like, it's not full yet. And finally, at some point, God's saying, that's it, I'm about to do something now because it's ready. And in this case right here, Elijah's like, it's time for a showdown, an altar of showdown. And as they're calling on the name of their God, they are cutting themselves. They are slashing themselves. There's people who do that today. They cut themselves, they hurt themselves, and they bleed out. Psychologists would tell you that this is a disorder. I would tell you it's demonic. It's not a disorder. It's not a disorder, it's demonic. It's been going on for 3,000 years or more. People doing this in conjunction because there's life in the blood, the Bible says, and pouring out blood to somehow appease in the spiritual realm. Although some people hurting might not understand why they're doing what they're doing, but I'm just telling you, people who cut and do this, it's a demonic influence because God is saying, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He's saying, love yourself and from that place, love your neighbor. And the devil is saying, no, hurt yourself. You, you see how counterfeit his ways are? And this is what's going on in the passage. This is, how, this is how far gone the country's going. That even the prophets are cutting themselves and, and, and you know, hurting themselves, trying to cry out to their God. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention in verse 10. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. And Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. So the altar of the Lord had been torn down. It's in shambles, and it looks like it's been like that for a long time. And the first thing Elijah does is, we are building this altar again. We are rebuilding this altar again. God's gonna get the glory. God's gonna get the honor. God's gonna get the praise and it's gonna happen, but it can't happen here. He wants to rebuild the altar, which is a profound picture. I wish I could have seen what this looked like on, on the setup for this, but he, but he builds this altar again. And this is because it, the reason the altar was torn down is society at the time did not want any public display of something representing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The society did not want anything displaying God, his ways, his will. The society did not want to see anything like that anywhere. Didn't want to be reminded of Yahweh, the great I am. They didn't want to be reminded of, so they said, tear them all down. We have that today. If there's a cross on a hill, get it off there. Why does it bother you? Yes, it does. Well, it's been there for 100 years and it's paid for. It still bothers me. Take it down. And we see litigation going to the Supreme Court about tearing down. Nativity scene, it bothers me. Get rid of it. And we see the same kind of thing now that we haven't seen, by the way, in thousands of years, but we're seeing it now where people are like, I don't like it. Get rid of it. And we're seeing a tearing down of this just like this. And I believe there's going to be a showdown. I believe you're going to see the, fam the power of God poured out in ways that is going to have, people are going to have to reconcile because they have no idea. Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. They know not what they're doing. Um, so he comes and he, and he rebuilds this altar and, and uh, he repairs it. And he recalls, remember we talked about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They all build altars. He's saying right here, God, you're the God of Jacob. We're going to pick up where they left off because God, it got off track. It was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're building offers, altars. There's blessing in that. You're showing up, God. You're blessing the land. They're following you. They got 12 sons. It started getting off track through the rest of the history. 
God, it's time to bring it all back to you where it belongs. We're rebuilding the altar and he calls that by name. He recalls Jacob and builds the altar 12 stones based on the 12 sons of Jacob, representative of the 12 tribes of Jacob. And if you understand that on a deeper dimension, God made promises. He made promises to the 12 sons, to the 12 tribes. This is the blessing to the nations. It's going to come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons, the 12 tribes. So when he puts the 12 stones down, he's building his altar on the promises of God. Listen, you can build your altar on the promises of God. You need to build your altar on the promises of God. You you need to build your altar, your encounters with God, with what God said already, where you can say, God, you say this. Can I stand on this, God? This is your word. You can do that. You have permission to do that. He did it right here. You build your altar on the promises of God because he's about to engage on God's terms. So he does it by God's methods, his ways, symbolically with the 12 tribes. And he moves on in in verse 33 and says, he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down, ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. And at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. See these people? So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and it also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate, prostrate, prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. This scene is radical. You got these other guys cutting themselves, saying, please do something with spears and knives, can't get any interaction because there are no other gods. It says in Isaiah, if there were, wouldn't I know, God says. There aren't any, but they're, they're calling on a demonic spirit and they're trying to get some action here and they're pouring out their blood and, and, and Elijah over here builds an altar on God's promises at this altar of showdown and pours water on it again and again. And again, and all of a sudden cries out to God and the scripture that said earlier, the God who answers by fire, he's the Lord. And God comes down, but he doesn't just burn the sacrifice and he doesn't just burn the wood. He burned everything that was there and the water and everything, everything was consumed. Everything was engulfed and the people were mesmerized by the power and presence of a God who is still proactive in a generation, even though you thought, why did God allow this? I thought we were lost. I thought, I thought evil had taken over the land and I, and, and I thought we were on the run and, and I thought, you know, it seemed like hell was having a heyday. I thought we were living in that time. God showed up in power and he does show up in power at these altars of showdown. And this is an altar of showdown. So the people turn their heart to God. Revival breaks out. The prophets of Baal are on the run and hell was literally run out of town that day in this encounter this showdown with God. I think it's amazing. It's an amazing snapshot. Israel was changed. Israel was changed. The Bible says in the end times, people will call good evil and evil good. The Bible says in the end times, I'm going to pour out my spirit on my sons and daughters. They will prophesy. They will dream dreams. That God's going to do things. There's going to be evidences of God's power among his people. We are living in a climate family where there is a drift. Oh, there's a drift. We're living in a place where people want things removed, things want changed, everything is, I mean, stay tuned. There's an agenda, just like there was back then. And God allows these for a season. But then there's an altar of showdown. And you and I, I believe, get to be part of this if we're altar building people. If we're altar building people, you and I will get in on what God has next in these altars of showdown. Um, The last thing I just want to conclude, I'm going to do this very briefly, is um, Romans 12, if you can just turn there. As you're turning there, I want to remind you as we, if the worship team can come up, it'd be great. As uh, we were talking about that movie, War Room, where does it come from? Uh, Matthew 6, 6, um, 
Jesus says, when you pray, go into the tamion, tamion is the Greek, the, the room in the room. What's the room in the room? Well, that would be in a bedroom. Maybe you have a closet, a room in a room. Yes. So we call it prayer closet. The word prayer closet is not in the Bible, but the tamion, tamion is the room in the room. Go to the inner, get, go in, get away, get off the grid. Find a spot where you seek God. The inner room, the prayer room, the warrior, war room. Find a place where you encounter me. Find a place where you build an altar. Find a place where you stop and seek me with all your heart and encounter me. And God will speak. God will reveal. God will show next steps. He will lay out strategies. This, these are the things that happen in these encounters with God. Um, so Romans 12, I just want to read this briefly and we're going we're to wrap up here today. Um, for you and I, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. So you and I don't come and actually offer animals. There hasn't been any animal sacrifice since the destruction of the temple anywhere in Israel's history. And Jesus fulfilled all of that sacramental, uh, sacrificial lamb. He was a sacrificial lamb. So we are made right with God by Jesus' sacrifice. But we still build these altars of meeting and encountering and seeking God, symbolically speaking. In Romans chapter 12, it talks about this altar. It talks about a way, a method, that if you and I do this, you and I can get in and understand God's will in a profound dimension, 3D. Get in and discern God's will. A lot of people don't know that God has a will, let alone understand what it is. You can know and discern and understand what God's will is. It's laid out right here. And I will have to say it comes at a cost. It's probably the hardest altar that you'll ever build. But it's also the most powerful altar that you can ever build. And it's right here in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. He's saying here, the world has a way of thinking, the world has a pattern, but God has a way of thinking and has a pattern. And they're completely different ones. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. But if we let the world's way of thinking and patterns consume us, then we're gonna completely miss out on even discerning and clocking what the will of God is. He's saying, be transformed. Don't go with the world's way of thinking and patterns. Be transformed, and here's how you get in on the will of God. Here's how you understand it. Here's how you get it. Here's how you crack the code, figure it out. It's all right here. The way you do it, it's through your act of worship and in mind. It is through the way we worship. We understand God's will. We will know it through the way we worship, through the way we build altars, through the way we seek God, the way we encounter God. This is how we will know God's will, and it says Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Whoa. If you have a Bible, you might want to underline that one because that is the most powerful altar, yet the hardest altar that you'll ever build. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. What he's saying is build an altar and put yourself on it. Whoa. Build an altar and put yourself on it. The good news is this. God doesn't want you dead. He wants you fully alive, fully, fully alive. God doesn't want a sacrificial death. He wants a sacrificial life. And when we put ourselves on this altar, the beauty of this is God's fire does not burn on the outside. Oh no, you won't even smell like smoke. (laughs) God's fire burns on the inside. When you put yourself on the altar of God as a living sacrifice and say, God, it's one thing to consecrate things, put other, I'm putting me on it, God. Now here's the problem with a living sacrifice. A dead sacrifice can't get off the altar, even if it wanted to. But a living sacrifice can. But if we choose not to, if we choose to get on the altar and as a living sacrifice choose to stay there, so to speak, spiritually speaking, symbolically saying, God, My heart's yours. It stays there. God, he still answers by fire, family. (laughs) We serve the God who answers by fire. On the day of Pentecost, he showed up. Mighty rushing winds, tongues of fire. Our God still answers by fire. 
But when we put ourselves on the altar of God, it doesn't burn on the outside, it burns on the inside. And if you will continue to commit to be an altar building son or daughter of God, of meeting with God, of saying, God, I wanna draw near to you. I wanna be intentional in my home. I wanna, I wanna have a place where I just commit to meeting you wherever it is. I wanna be an altar building son or daughter of God because I believe, God, you will honor those times of seeking you. I believe I will encounter you. I will be changed. My soul will be forever changed in these encounters. I will, if I put myself on the altar, God, you won't hurt me. Your plans are not to harm me, they're to prosper me, give me a hope and a future. But if I put myself on the altar, God, you're not gonna burn anything on the outside, but you are gonna burn on the inside in a beautiful way. And he will light your heart on fire and people might even come to watch you burn and not know what it is. And it's the fire of God in your life. And we're living in a time more than ever where you need the fire of God to burn on the inside like never before. Our God still answers by fire. The true God answers by fire. And I just want to close in prayer. I want to ask you, I don't know if you feel like you're in that sense of saying, God, I believe you, I respect you, but I haven't actually got on the altar. I mean, personally, that's, ugh, that's pretty huge right there. I want to encourage you this morning. This is where it begins. You want the fire of God to burn in you? You got to get on the altar. Jesus said you got to die to live. Anyone who tries to save his life will lose it. Anyone who loses his life for my sake will gain it. This is the abundant life, this paradox of you die to live, not physically. Say, yes, I, I go low so you can go high, God. This is where it's all about. So I just want to close in prayer right now. I want to ask you to search your heart. If that's you, just to stand, I want to, I want to pray for us, all of us, but I want to also pray for any of you this morning who have a sense to say, you know, it's time to get on the altar. I haven't actually, quote unquote, said that or done that, and symbolically, I want to do that. If that's you this morning, just stand and, and just have this moment with God and make the most of this opportunity. Um, so, Lord, we just come before you this morning. And we appreciate you, we respect you, we honor you, and we thank you, God. But there's something deeper you're calling us to because you're the God who answers by fire. And there's gotta be a showdown even in our own life on who's on the throne. Who's the king? Who's the Lord of our universe? Is it us or you? And God, we, we say today for anyone standing, God, we step down off the throne. We get off and put you on it. God, we demote ourselves, we promote you. We are not king, you are king. And Lord, we put ourselves on an altar. If you want to put yourself on the altar this morning, stand up and let the Lord know. Just raise your hands up to him and say, yes, Lord. I put myself on the altar, Lord. And I'm alive and you want me so alive. But I'll even be more alive if I'm on the altar with you, God. Because you will infuse a life in me that I, don't, I can't comprehend on my own. I can't fabricate or create. But you give life. You're the giver of life. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, for an impart an imparting of your spirit, God, that you, you won't burn on the outside, but you will burn on the inside. You are still the God who answers by fire, God. And I pray, Lord God, you'd pour out your spirit, pour out your fire on your sons and daughters, Lord, that we would be altar building children of the most high God, that it will be common that we meet with you. It'll be common that we seek, with, seek you, God. It'll be common that we have genuine encounters with you and that our soul will be changed, God. There'd be transformation that happens, God. But I just pray, God, that this altar, living sacrifices, that we would get on it and we won't get off it. That we'd say, God, it, our life is not our own. <laughs> We've been bought with a price. So even though I could get off this altar, I say, no, I'm not going to. Because my life is not my own anymore. So Lord, I just want to pray for profound blessing for everyone who's taken that level of consecration today, Lord God. And I just pray for all of us, Lord, in this room, Lord, that we would be some altar building sons and daughters. We would understand the power of the altar, not the physical altar, the spiritual altar to stop and to get intentional with meeting you and seeking you and encountering you. Because when we do, you reveal your love, you reveal your power, your ways, your grace, your mercy, your, your direction, God. You reveal so many things. We love you, God. We thank you in advance for all you're doing in our life and some of the new things that you're even starting today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen, amen. This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. We pray that this message has blessed you. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, 
please visit us at valleymetrochurch.com.